Good morning, Mr. Jones. Now we don't mean to be abusive, but this is a hospital and not an all-inclusive. So shape up, look tough. You've been lying there long enough and you're going home today. You just had major surgery. You still are dazed and bleeding, but I checked your chart this morning and it seems that you're still breathing. So buck up, show some soul. Better take your ivy pole cause you're going home to Hey, babe, did you see the CBC Top Story? I don't follow Canadian news, Boo Bear. Oh, here. Healthcare in crisis, emergency rooms full to bursting. How is that news? I mean, what a day to start as junior policy analyst for the Provincial Ministry of Health. Ha! I'll call you back after my orientation. Whew. The provinces have regions and the regions have sites The sites have subdivisions and they all have fights It's layered and large and there's no one in charge It's the system that's not Welcome to the healthcare system Access to care is fair as in me You say you can't navigate You can't even straight Well neither can we Provinces tell Ottawa, but out this is our sphere. The regions tell the provinces, step back and let us steer. The doctors tell the regions, we're the pros, don't interfere. And everyone keeps doing what they did last year. So here are welcome to the healthcare system. A whole lot of roles you can't tell apart. Then just when you know the score, we get a new organizational chart. When it's really bad, we add a man. It's more like a disorientation. Bunch of clowns, boo. Let's not be harsh. If they had it all figured out, they wouldn't need me. That's why they hired a policy analyst. <laughs> why did we hire a policy analyst? All the other provinces have one. If we don't get one soon, we'll be left behind. But what does he do? Well, when we make a decision, he can tell us why. It was a good idea. Would you like to meet him? I can invite him to our integrated access and flow meeting. Yeah, I want to see what we're paying for. Oh my gosh, I just got invited to a meeting with the deputy minister. <gasps> Way to go, chicken nugget. You are gonna fix that crisis and then you're gonna find a job in America, closer to me. I haven't stopped applying, tater tot, but this is exciting. After all those years of grad school, I finally get to do something important. Oh, I've got a meeting across campus. Catch you later, boo. <laughs> All my education has prepared me for this day Countless papers, years of sifting false from fact Every chart and quote and reference is suddenly of consequence For the government needs evidence to act and I can save the system I can turn this ship I can write key points For those who don't read past the paper clip And my report will never Gather dust on something
someone's shelf For I can save the system from itself I'll spend hours poring over every policy Some may think it's boring But that's why they need me For I will save the system I will reach my dreams I will interview the frontline staff and analyze the themes Then I'll speak truth to power And power will make room And I can save the system from its doom Even if I have to spend my life On Zoom We are having this meeting because our emergency rooms are in crisis. Wait times are dangerously long. When did the crisis begin? Years ago, but then COVID hit and everyone avoided the ER like the plague. Oh, those were the days. Now they're all back and it's even more packed than it was before. And an infection hazard. We need a plan, now. I have a list of the hospital chief's pet projects. I'll get my admin to reformat it with the title plan. Good, I'm late for my next meeting. Pardon me. But maybe if you explored the problem more deeply. D typical researcher, we do not have the luxury of time. Maybe that's where I could help you. Would you like me to investigate why the emergency rooms are so crowded and get back to you? Yes, why don't you go do that? Great, I'll work as fast as I can. <laughs> Shmoopsie, I got my first assignment right from the deputy minister. My Wookie the Wonder Boy. I'm going to the emergency room. <laughs> you and everybody else. Oh, you mean people are coming in with sniffles and ingrown toenails and that's why it's so crowded. You think it takes all day to fix an ingrown toenail? I could do 10 of those in minutes. I'm talking about problems we can't fix. Like every week or two, you stop and finish your prescription. But again, you're coughing from sleeping in the snow. Found a shelter, spent some nights there. Picked up hepatitis and mysterious bites there. Headed for petition via malnutrition. Where you gonna go? Right here. Come in, come off the street. So that's the kind of patient you mean. That's one kind. Hey, Grandma, you're not coping. Good for you, you found a door that's always open. Feeling weak and dizzy, maybe something's broken. You'll be moving slow. Home care's maxed out, daughter's burned out. Doctor's on vacation, that's the way it turned out. Can't take a rain track when you're a train wreck.
scuffer and you can't afford your puffer. Come to emergency. The panic is attacking and the doctor sent you packing. Come to emergency. If a better option does exist but has a two-year waiting list. Come to emergency. Or if they won't go near you because you don't meet their criteria. Come to emergency. Bring us your social news. Doctor, we'll see you now. I'm here to see the emergency doctor. Dr. Kilau, chief resident. It's nice to meet you. Oh, oh you as well. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Larry. I, uh, I'm trying to find out why the ER is so crowded. Uh, I've been hearing it's full of people you can't help. It's incredibly frustrating. Then there's the people who do need hospital care, but I have to send them to five consults and 10 tests before anyone will admit them. And what is the point when the wards can't take them anyway? What do you mean? Half my emergency beds are filled with admitted patients. We have to decant them to the inpatient wards. Decant? Sorry if that sounds horrible. We talk as if our patients were a liquid we need to pour over. From here to there. Exactly. But we can't. We can't decant. Emergency can't decant. We're hanging on by the thinnest threads. But all the wards say they've got no beds. We can't decant. Those patients waiting in the waiting room are at the risk of harm. Sometimes we pull the fire alarm. But still it seems that no one cares. They say you can't just let admitted patients sit there Upstairs. Why are the inpatient wards using hallways? Ask one of the nurse managers. Uh, excuse me, why are these hallways full of patients? These aren't hallways. These are alternative care spaces. Okay, why are these alternative care spaces full of patients? We can't decant. The hospital can't decant. Just show me any two-foot square space. I'll show you an alternative care space. We can't decant. There's patients waiting for a nursing home who sit here by the week. And those whose needs are more unique. Well, that kind leave me close to tears all day. I phoned around and found there's nowhere you can fit someone who just fits someone. One little nibble and they stay for years. Why don't the nursing homes accept more patients? Talk to them. And don't forget home care. We can't decant. The nursing home can't decant. For I can give you my word wholehearted. Our only departures are the departed. We can't decant. Now he's got folks in there who could have lived at home with home support. Except our budget's kinda short. Our home care caseloads are sky high, so we say no, we need more dough to ease the strain on nursing homes. And they remain in nursing homes until they die. Take your patients, it's just not fair. Not until they start pulling into long-term care. Better, Better cough, cough up, up the cash if you want us to pull. Our pockets are empty cause the wards are full. So, so in case you didn't hear our rest, we can't decant. We can't.
Have you wrapped up the project yet, Gummy Bear? It's just beginning, Angel Cake. Get this. Apparently, no one can move their patients because every place is full of patients who should be someplace else. <laughs> so what's the solution? Well, that's what I'm going to find out. Hi, Milkshake, it's me, returning your call. Which one? Today, yesterday, the day before? I'm sorry, Pudding Pop. I've just been swamped researching how to unclog the hospitals. Listen, Captain Crunch, you are wasting yourself on that government gong show. There are dozens of corporate jobs out here. I mean, you could actually be achieving something. What, helping millionaires get richer? Gee, that sounds meaningful. <laughs> What's meaningful about banging your head against the wall? You got to remember that people's lives are at stake. <sighs> Did you remember it's my birthday on Friday? Oh, no, I lost track. Okay, <laughs> well, I'm having a party and you're gonna call in, right? Oh, yes, I wouldn't miss it. <laughs> and then we're going to party like it's 4.45, yikes. Uh, I'm gonna be late for my meeting with the hospital president. <laughs> We are doing everything we can to free up beds by discharging patients faster. We have discharge checklists, discharge charts, discharge boards, discharge rounds, and a utilization management tool. <laughs> and somehow we just can't get the staff to focus. So we hired a flow nurse. <laughs> She's our most valuable player. And what's her role? Ah, if a patient has stayed here too long, she kicks them out. I mean, uh, she gets them home. But the nurse manager said the ones who stay too long have nowhere else to go. Who exactly is she getting home? Good morning, Mr. Jones. Now we don't mean to be abusive, but this is a hospital and not an all-inclusive. So shape up, look tough. You've been lying there long enough and you're going home today. You just had major surgery. You still are dazed and bleeding, but I checked your chart this morning and it seems that you're still breathing so buck up show some soul better take your ivy pole because you're going home today we ensure the i's are dotted and all the t's are crossed we manage your utilization and we calculate the cost we've got no time to treat you so you might as well get lost and help reduce the average length of stay Sad to have to rush you out, we know just how you feel. But if you stick around too long, you'll get C. difficile. So no harm, no prod, recover somewhere else, you slob. You're going home today. We're packed with folks in wheelchairs whose houses don't have ramps. There's no room at the nursing home, we can't get rid of gramps. At solving complex problems, we are really not the champs. So you're the kind we send upon their way. This noble continent from shore to shore to shore They're under constant pressure to get patients out the door So don't speak, don't freak See you again within the week You're going home, you're going home You're going home today So that's the solution? Just booting patients out? Well, if primary care doctors did their jobs, maybe we'd wind up with fewer patients here in the first place. Are you saying that family doctors are to blame? Oh, I'm not pointing fingers. <laughs> but we'd all be better off if they just followed clinical practice guidelines. Well, then I've got to see a family doctor. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> I'm here to see the doctor. Take a number. I, I mean, uh, I, I'm investigating quality of care. I've heard that uh, some expert groups have written guidelines to help doctors choose the right tests and treatments oh, for different- honey. My doctor don't follow no guidelines. Primary care is the Wild West. <laughs> Oh, I want 
once had some chest pain and my doctor got bent. He whipped out a scalpel and he put in a stand. I can throw in a bypass here, sign this consent. My doctor don't follow no guidelines no more. Well, I went for a checkup. I thought I was fine. But she wrote me prescriptions about 29. Now I'm out for a free cruise from GlaxoSmithKline. My doctor don't follow no guidelines no more. Well, I got diabetes, but there's no time for me. My last foot exam was in 2003. She's too busy testing our vitamin D. My doctor don't follow no guidelines no more. Why not? To cook from a cookbook, to follow a rule, that's not why we all went to medical school. So respect our experience and our expertise. Bugger off with your guidelines. I'll do what I please. Well, I never would say that my doctor's a quack, but he took out my kidney and then put it back. It was all fee for service, and I'm in the black. My doctor don't follow no guidelines no more. If I read No time to pee rat the faxes and emails the pile up each week. I said, bugger off, and my patient's unique. Well, my doctor says medicine's really an art. Put a valve in my stomach and staple my heart. Turns out he was looking at the wrong patient's chart. My doctor don't follow no guidelines no more. My doctor don't follow no guidelines no more. Are you a doctor? Nope. I'm an American. I'm here to see the doctor. Maybe you could tell me if things are different in the States. Does your doctor follow guidelines? Oh, I once had a headache, so the doctor I've seen, he gave me a PET scan, but it came out clean. Then he gave me two more cuts. He owns the machine. My doctor don't follow no guidelines no more. My doctor. Thank you so much for your time. I can't wait to tell my girlfriend that we talked about the American healthcare system. Well, she's American. That. <gasps> I missed your party. Oh no! Wait a minute. Guidelines are not the real issue. Unwarranted deviation from guidelines is just one aspect of a fragmented system. The real issue is that primary care is the wild west. A lot of autonomous individuals doing their own thing, not prepared to answer to any central authority. So, how do we coordinate a system response to emergency crowding if a key player doesn't see itself as part of the system? Hey! And another Lady! Thing. Most doctors are nothing like the outrageous caricature is presented in that song. What the hell? But what is more, well, guidelines were never meant as a substitute for clinical judgment. Not every guideline is legitimate or appropriate. Clear the set! Way. We're and trying to shoot a musical here! Policymakers bear a lot of responsibility for the function and one. I am so sorry I missed your party. No worries. We partied without you like it was 4.45. Amber. You know how I care about you, but I have a chance to make a real difference here. If I could just figure out the solution. Oh, listen to this. 
I just found out that family doctors are a part of the answer, but they're not a part of the system. That's what I don't get. How can they not be a part of the system? I mean, they're not paid a salary, but they bill the government, so why- There you go again! You're obsessed! I promise I will make it up to you just as soon as I present my report to the stakeholder team. Stakeholder team? Is that bureaucrat ease? What? I, I had to pick up their lingo to earn their trust. It's about building relationships. You can't have a relationship with a bureaucracy, Larry. They will chew you up and spit you out. Amber! I... Oh, Tommy Douglas, father of Medicare. How did you make sense of it all? The answer you seek is buried deep in the history of health policy. Oh! Who are you? I am the ghost of Tommy Douglas. You look different. Animation is not an insured service. I know. I mean, you know, what I can't figure out is why doctors don't see themselves as a part of the system. Listen, and I will tell you the secret that lies at the very heart of Medicare. Canadians hold Medicare sacred just like hockey and Timmy's and Beavers. But before it became a sacred trust, most doctors were unbelievers. When those independent professionals saw it coming down the pike, they went into a massive sulk and out on a massive strike. They feared for their autonomy. They heaped us with slander and scorn. So I had to devise a compromise when Medicare was born. The doctor struck, the talks were stuck, the whole social fabric was torn. That's correct. So, so you I had, had to devise a compromise when Medicare was born. We could not move without approval from this most formidable player. But they would not bow till we disavow any use of our power as payer. So to each good doc who voiced their shock at this putative power grab, I gave my assurance we're just the insurance. We just want to pick up the tab. We'll pay you fees for whatever you please. Authority we have forsworn. Such was the size of the compromise when Medicare was born. To this day still we foot the bill, but our lack of power we mourn. Now you see, now, now you I realize, realize the compromise, compromise when Medicare was, was born. born. Now once we'd recovered from getting them covered, the struggle I meant to renew. For the national scheme that's truly my dream is Medicare Part 2. National Pharmacare, National Home Care, National Every Care You Can Think Of. But alas, no government's made it so, neither liberal nor Tory. Go figure. And as the greatest Canadian, what can I say but I'm sorry? We'll move someday past user pay, but now with that hope so forlorn, I apologize for the compromise when Medicare was born. Perhaps someday the docks will sway, but till that most glorious morn, till that morn we, we apologize, apologize for the compromise when Medicare was born. We apologize for the compromise when Medicare was born. Well, no wonder the system is so scary. It's the ghosts of negotiations past. <laughs> And I didn't even mention federal, provincial, territorial negotiations. And don't get me started on the hospitals or the nursing homes. What we call a system is more like a collection of haphazardly assembled parts. That's it. That's why the healthcare system doesn't fit the needs we see today. It was never designed to. It was never designed at all. Then we have to design it. Do you think we can do it? 
Courage, my friend. Tis not too late to build a better world. Ah, a collection of haphazardly assembled parts. Are you ready to present your report? Absolutely. I can't wait to share my findings with the deputy minister. Actually, the deputy minister will not be with us today. He has a conflicting integrated system improvement meeting. Oh, I thought emergency room crowding was a priority. It is a priority. It's just not at the top of our list right now. But we invited some stakeholders and the executive director of Access and Care Transition. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's hear your report. It won't be easy or quick, but as long as we expect the emergency room to be all things to all people, it will be crowded all the time. We need to redesign the system so that the services fit the population's needs. Thank you, Larry. And thank you, stakeholders. Now, down to business. What are other provinces doing? Is there a cost-free option? What if some people don't like it? What about all the strategies that we already have in place? Are you saying you need more knowledge or more resources or you just need to keep doing what you're doing? Yes. We don't know how to do it and we can't afford to do it and we're already doing it. So your report is great, but we don't have time to read it and we've already read it and it's nothing that we didn't know and open to debate. to action we've already taken action which the minister would never allow because we don't know how to do it and we can't afford to do it in point of fact we're doing it now now let me get this straight you say you don't know how to do it and you can't afford to do it and you're already doing it but it's complex and slow but you don't have time to do it and you're not allowed to do it yet somehow you say you're doing it am i right well yes and no we've achieved so much already doesn't seem like much at all well you can't expect results so soon but from the team so small that's why we're not the ones to do it but nobody else can do it so don't ask us why we haven't begun because we don't know how to do it and we can't afford to do it we're not allowed to do it and we're doing it and we're done no 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 no, no. hey sugar pop so I hit a brick wall with the bureaucrats. You were right, they're not gonna change anything. Oh, what a shock. But it's made me realize what's really important, us. I'm gonna dedicate all of my time to finding a job near you and- Larry, there's something I have to tell you. What? I met a CEO. Oh, that's great. Maybe you could get us both jobs and then- uh... Oh, no. Oh, you mean- Yeah. When? While you were keeping me waiting. Look, I am sorry to have to do this on the day that your big report flopped. Goodbye, Larry. It didn't flop. It just hasn't found the right person. I'm going straight to the Minister of Health. And that's how we're making life better for ordinary people and families. <laughs> oh, we just got a question from uh, Larry. Uh, have you had a chance to look at my report on emergency room crowding? <gasps> of course, I read all reports personally. It's marvelous. <laughs> There's just one thing that's a little controversial and that's the part about system redesign. Uh, Larry says, Minister, that's the whole report. 
<laughs> now, I know our system needs to be built around those who are most important. Uh, voters. <laughs> I take my responsibility very seriously. And that's to keep everyone happy. Uh, how can they be happy with 12-hour wait times? Uh, exactly! We're always funding improvement projects. Just last month, we saw a wonderful project that shaved off two minutes. Ooh, but changing the system. What if we made things worse? I've always maintained it behooves politicians to learn from our stakeholders, partners, or both. I went out and shadowed our frontline physicians, and there on the night shift, I heard an oath. The Hippocratic Oath. First do no harm, then do no harm. Keep on not doing and cause no alarm. If you're decisive, it might be divisive. So focus on doing no harm. Larry says, are you saying you make no decisions? How could you think that? There's some things that we've had no trouble deciding And our record should silence the nitpicking snobs There's a new MRI machine in every swing riding And our other priorities include saving jobs like mine. First do no harm, then do no harm. Fund pilot projects and don't bet the farm. If it's only a pilot, then who can revile it? For clearly it's doing no harm. Former Premier Fred Flinders, he fought Four hundred physios, he fired four hundred physios just fifteen years ago. Now, if ever the voters seem less than inspired, I just haul out those physios that Fred Flinders fired, and I first do. When we're back in opposition But until we're defeated We'll run On all the things we haven't done There are so many Yes, all the harm we haven't done Tonight's breaking news. The provincial government falls on a vote of no confidence. Hey, it's Amber. Leave a message. Amber, it's me. I was thinking maybe we could talk. Listen, we're probably getting a new government. Maybe the new premier will use my report and then you'll see that my work does make a difference and we could... After last week's dramatic election upset, our new Premier is giving his first press conference. I'm here to fix health care by running it like a business. Our citizens have been waiting too long and spending too much. I can get you long waits for much less. I mean, I can spend less and get you short waits. 
and better outcomes. And a pony. Mr. Premier, Mr. Premier, I'm glad to hear you're open to change. Uh, some politicians then think that any change might cause harm. That doesn't frighten me at all. I'd like to offer my services. Can I help you find evidence to help fix emergency room crowding? The hospitals are already fixing that. I've made sure of it. Oh, how did you do that? <laughs> I told them, failure is not an option. Have they been considering it as an option? The bottom line is, they've already made a plan. But you can help me with something else. I can? You can help me find evidence that patients should pay for their own health care. You want me to find evidence for private health care? If we had a thriving private market, it would take the pressure off the public system. We'd have short wait times and money to spare. But, Premier, the evidence says a private market would undermine the public system. It wouldn't magically create more doctors and nurses. It would create a two-tier system where the rich jump the queue while the rest of us wait. And studies have found that private companies cherry-pick the healthy patients and the skimp on quality and run up huge administrative costs. Now look here, and young man. You might have read some studies, but I read a Fraser Institute report. You read one report advocating for a parallel private system and... I didn't just read it. I tested it in my personal life. In your personal life? How? The critics of healthcare sang a sad, sad song. The costs are steep and the queues are long. Let's take the pressure off the system, they cried. We need a private system on the side. I'm certain that their plan would be effective. I know it from an intimate perspective. Sometimes I have an affair to take the pressure off my marriage. Cause my marriage needs a brand new lease on life. And all the women I pursue who can't wait to jump my queue are much appreciated by my wife. And at the end of the day, when I come home from cherry picking, she's delighted by the pleasant atmosphere. It's clear that she has felt protected and not the least neglected since the day our T42 became two tier. I know my wife won't feel the squeeze when I pay bills for diamonds, furs, and other administrative fees. I'm sure my wife will get a grip. If I should bring some hottie home for a little public-private partnership, it's great to have an affair. It's what I call a fair arrangement. And the Fraser Institute has been my source. Cause there's no limit, there's no end To the beds I can attend I'll put my marriage and the system back on course I'm sure that nothing could work better But divorce Amber! Oh. 
Hello? Hi. It's Dr. Kailao from Emergency. Uh, hi. You asked if I do a follow-up interview. How about now? Sure. Um, why not? Uh, oh, here. So, uh, how is Emergency doing under the Premier's tough new plan? Some would say we've never done better. It's the new full capacity protocol. When the merge gets full, we trigger an alert and push the patients upstairs. Weren't the inpatient units already so full that they had patients in the hallways? But their hallways are safer than ours. Truly, it's hardly ideal. But on the brighter side, it's cleared out so much, I finally have time for a coffee. But how are the inpatient staff coping? Well, you'd have to ask them. Oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> we are doing everything we can to deal with the influx of patients. We've even instituted a 9 a.m. bed meeting for all the unit managers to sort it out. Doesn't that take valuable time? 20 minutes tops. It's so short, in fact, that sometimes we need a pre-meeting to prep and a post-meeting to decide what gets escalated to the regional call at 11 and the provincial one at 12. But it's working! Ah. Sometimes we don't even need the 3 p.m. bed huddle. And how often are the units over capacity? Always. That's why it's critical to have that real-time planning. Well, isn't real-time a little late for planning? Uh, research shows that healthcare demand follows daily and seasonal patterns. Some demand is even controllable, like scheduled surgery. So why not plan ahead? You're not getting it. I'll patch you into a meeting. You'll see that we deal with a lot that's unpredictable, sometimes even shocking. Case in point. Three new medicine emissions from emergency! Oh, what a shock! Oh, what a shock! It seems to me most patients from emergency require internal medicine, but we are out of beds for them. We say we're full emergence hurt. They page us with a rat alert. They trigger that new protocol until we loudly squawk. We don't have any space at all. The outcome of your protocol is piling patients in the hall till there's no room to walk. Oh, what a shock! So please won't someone spare a bed? Someone share a bed? Someone plan this morning, didn't plan ahead, but right now that's irrelevant. We're 45% overcomplement to bed, to bed, to bed. Any beds in surgery? We booked a week's worth of knee replacement for today! Oh, what a shock! Oh, what a shock. We usually have beds to spare in surgery, but surgeons schedule when they please, and Tuesdays they do hips and knees. All weekend we play helping roles while all the docs play 18 holes. But suddenly it's Tuesday and the schedule patients knock. We scheduled them, but we're a gas. We simply can't provide a fast electro total arthroplasty when we're chock a block. Oh, what a shock. So please won't someone spare a bed, someone share a bed. Hips and knees need expertise, but now we're in the red. So make it pediatric, geriatric, psychiatric. If it has a mattress, and it has a bed. I need medicine beds for my surgery patients because my surgery beds are full of medicine patients. Here come two more. Oh, oh what a shock. shock. Oh, what a shock. A true one soon. Admissions peak from 10 till noon, but staffing levels stay the same as in the patient's flock. We cleared our beds the night before. We never guessed there would be more sick patients coming in the door today. It's 12 o'clock. Oh, what a shock. 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 It's 12 o'clock. So please vote some. Keep up the pressure forever. What happens when it all comes crashing down? That is above my pay grade. But there's a provincial call at noon. I'm not sure the policymakers will want to hear from me, but I have to try. I'll be there. We just piloted our new form for the bed meeting, and it- Forgive me for crashing your meeting, but I couldn't sit idly by while your hospitals are in chaos. Please, let me help you. Chaos is normal. It's refreshing to see some change. 
Sometimes it takes a burning platform. Plus, we've made it through implementation. The crisis is over. Wait, if the crisis is over, that means we can finally talk about system change. All we need is a moment of quiet, reflective- Run for your lives! The accreditors are coming! The creditors are coming? No! The accreditors! Cat doesn't know where to hide. Accreditation Canada comes once every four years to give us an assessment and recommendations. <laughs> if they find that we haven't made progress on last year's recommendations, then they'll shut us down. Do something, Larry. Now? Yes, now. They're coming in minutes. Tell them we've made comprehensive evidence-based improvements. But you rejected the evidence at every turn. Well, what can I do? Lie to the accreditors? Would you? No! Uh, I've tried so hard to become a part of your team so that I can find the evidence you need and get it to you right away. But it turns out that you don't even want evidence. No, you just want someone to make excuses for what you're already doing, and you can do that just fine without me. I quit. But we've got accreditors coming. How can we convince them we've met their standard on access and flow and transitions of care? I've had a transition of care. I used to care, now I don't care. Oh, come on, Larry. How hard would it be to say that we're doing something with an evidence base? It would be the easiest thing in the world if you were unscrupulous. Just go on Google Scholar, cherry pick a few studies, and then twist them to support whatever you like. Could we pretend there's an evidence base for anything? Well, sure, you could. Every single thing in this place, thing in this place has an evidence base. The use of time, the use of space, it all has an evidence base. And furthermore, every single manager here, manager here is a true pioneer. All best practices we embrace, this has an evidence base. Strategy has only five minutes. I can solve our problem. What? No! Every single thing in this no! place, thing in this place has an evidence base. The lights, the mood, we thermalize food, it all has an evidence base. And furthermore, every single manager here, manager here is a true pioneer. The waiting room is no disgrace, it has an evidence base. We have done so well, the sensors will survey our work with pride. Hundreds of Purell dispensers, don't pull the lever, there's nothing inside. Every single thing in this place, thing in this place has an evidence space. The protocol has an evidence base. The protocol has an evidence base. And furthermore, every single manager here, manager here is a true pioneer. We won the innovation race. We have an evidence base. We will ace accreditation. We will have no fear of us. We will be an inspiration. Finally, someone will imitate us. Oh, congratulations, everyone! on the most successful accreditation visit we have ever had. <laughs> I have to give a special thank you to Larry, without whose... Larry? Larry? Dr. K. Lau. It's Lily. I heard you quit, and I couldn't let you go without saying goodbye and thanking you. For helping people lie? No, for speaking up for people who want to see change. Thank you. But it didn't help. I made it my mission to speak truth to power, and power wasn't listening. I'll never save the system. Who says it's all up to you? Larry, there you are. We want to recruit you as our new chief information officer. Chief Information Officer, what's that? <laughs> it's a management fad from the 90s. If we don't get one soon, we'll be left behind. What do you say, Larry? Do you want to help us lead improvement? Do you really want me to help you improve, or do you just want me to help you pretend to improve? More the second one. 
but it's not our fault. If we started messing with the system, then people would start calling the minister and then we would all lose our jobs. The public does not understand the finer points of health policy. That can be your first assignment. Find out how to change the system without the public knowing about it. I have a better idea. Why don't we bring the public into the conversation? What? And be accountable to them? How do we even start a conversation about the healthcare system? It's so complicated. Even for us. Larry, how do we start the conversation? We could start with an introduction. <laughs> Still want to go for that coffee? I'd like that. 